essence. But before that, I have to tell you what cellular essence is, and I hope um, I, I, can, I can do a good job and, and interest you. Um, uh, well, let me start with uh, young and old cells. We are all familiar with the idea of what a young cell is, and I put here a picture of a, of a car, optimally function, functional. Okay. Um, old cells are like old cars. They are still functioning, and they have subtle differences. It's not so easy to distinguish an old cell from a young cell. People have been trying to find um, oxidation in the DNA, proteins, lipids, and so on, and small defects. But I have to say that all the changes that have been found over the years are not so robust and are not so dramatic. Young cells and old cells are not that different. Another thing that is uh, highly questionable is how many old cells have an old person? Because as you know, stem cells are young and they maintain young for a long time and they keep dividing slowly. So it's not clear if the cells that are present in an old person are all damaged. That is not clear at all. But I have to introduce you here a third type of cell that is a the focus of a lot of attention during the last years, and are the senescent cells. Senescent cells are dysfunctional cells, are cells that are severely damaged, and they cannot work at all. That is the difference between an old cell and a senescent cell. Senescent cells are not functional, but they are trying to do something important, and as I will try to explain. Young cells, the, the, the threshold of damage to activate senescence is higher than in the case of old cells. Old cells are closer to this threshold, but still they can work and function normally. So here is the challenge for you, I hope, and is that I can convince you how important these senescent cells, not the old cells, but the senescent cells, how important they are in aging, but more importantly, in many aging-associated pathologies. As you will see, I think that essentially all human diseases are accompanied by these senescent cells. Even if they are happening in young persons, they always have these senescent cells. Um, so this is, again, to say the same thing. This will be the young or old cells in our body, and when they acquire damage beyond a certain threshold, they activate a program that is called senescence and is represented here. This program is a genetic program, like apoptosis, in which there are pathways, biochemical pathways, that are very well understood. I'm not going to talk about them. The two main uh, actors there are the P16 tumor suppressor gene and the P53 tumor suppressor gene and others, and they activate this program. It's a program that involves the uh, remodeling of the, of the genome. The epigenetic is changed, and the cells acquire a new configuration of the epigenome, and they change. It's a reprogramming. So if a cell was a, an hepatocyte, it stops being an hepatocyte. It becomes something else, a senescent hepatocyte, or an epithelial intestinal cell that is senescent now, or a senescent neuron, or a senescent cardiomyocyte. Uh, one property of the senescent cells is that they don't divide because they have changed their chromatin and they cannot divide even if they are stimulated to divide. The other thing is that they are highly secretory. They devote all their resources. They are very active metabolically, and they devote all their resources to secrete proteins. And they are not doing this just by mistake. They are doing this because this is part of the program. They are trying to alarm, to alert the tissue that there was a damage, that there was a severe damage. And 
As you can see here, there are cytokines, chemokines, growth factors. This is important. These growth factors are going to, to be used by the surrounding cells to repair the tissue. There are fibrotic factors, like TGF beta, and there are proteases for the extracellular matrix. All of this is, is the telltale of a, a tissue that has to be repaired. So senescent cells are the ones that, that notify the organism that the tissue has to be repaired. Um, but this, if this repair is successful, these senescent cells that are dysfunctional, they have to be eliminated. And they are eliminated by macrophages and natural killer cells, and perhaps other cells. But at least we know that these two uh, cell types are involved. And this is the successful repair. So when we are young or under normal conditions, these cells are appearing constantly. When we have an infection, when we are exposed to toxics, these cells happen also due to accidents, and they are eliminated. This is a constant process of uh, repair. <clears throat> the problem comes uh, here, and is when we are exposed to chronic damage, when the system is abused and a tissue is constantly undergoing damage because of a chronic infection, for example, or because of a chronic abuse of a toxics, uh, or because we are getting too old, because we are constantly exposed to random and stochastic damage. And that those conditions, for reasons that are not well understood, this uh, clearance doesn't happen. And the consequence of that is devastating. These cells accumulate. They accumulate, they are trying to repair the tissue unsuccessfully, and they keep accumulating, and they and one of the consequences of this accumulation is that they are producing a chronic inflammation because of the production of these cytokines here, and also fibrosis because they are producing TGF beta and growth factors, and the fibroblasts from the stroma of the tissue are the ones that start to proliferate and to produce collagen. And this is the, the typical uh, combination of uh, um, cellular defects that happen in many diseases, and is the presence of senescence, the presence of fibrosis, and the presence of chronic inflammation. I'm going to talk first about this, a, a little bit about what we are doing in this area. And um, for that, I have to introduce an artificial system. I have to say that up front. When, um, work of many years on wound healing or tissue repair has shown that one of the first things that happen when a tissue is injured is that some cells, and it's not clear which ones, they differentiate. It's not the resident somatic stem cells, the ones that are activated, are differentiated cells that they differentiate. And these the differentiated cells are the ones that take the role of progenitors and they repair the tissue. But understanding how, how this the differentiation happens is extremely complicated. So we took a, short, a shortcut, and the shortcut is to use the Yamanaka factors. As you know, the uh, Yamanaka, uh, more than 10 years ago now, found four transcription factors. OCT4, SOX2, KL4, and MIG. And these transcription factors, they act in a team, and they are able to hijack the, the transcriptional machinery of any cell. And they convert any cell into embryonic pluripotent stem cells. So these four transcription factors are able to modify the epigenetics to change all the resident transcription uh, programs, and they can convert a neuron into a pluripotent stem cell. They can convert an intestinal cell, an epith in, uh, lung cell, an alveolar cell, a pancreatic cell, any kind of cell can be converted into a pluripotent stem cell. So we are trying to use these Yamanaka factors as a way to induce the differentiation in vivo. We are trying to go backwards if pluripotent stem cells are the ones that produce the, the adult organism, 
we are trying to go backwards, in vivo, in the mice. So for that, we generated mice where we can induce with doxycycline, we can induce in all cells, we can induce the four Yamanaka factors. And what we were expecting is that if we give this doxycycline, the Yamanaka factors are activated everywhere in the body, and perhaps all the cells in the body would go backwards in development, and this adult mouse would be converted into a giant embryo. This is not what happened, but something like that happened. Uh, uh, um, when I say something like that, is what happens is because these Yamanaka factors are known to be inefficient. About, to give a number, about one in a thousand cells are reprogrammed in vitro. And the same happens in vivo. Only one in a thousand is reprogrammed. So what we observed were foci of uh, cells that started to de-differentiate and to become embryonary. I'm going to show you this in a second. And this is a summary of what we observed, is that after one week of activating the Yamanaka factors, many cells in many different tissues, they, they differentiate. And this is what we are interested in. We are interested in inducing the differentiation in adult tissues. So we induce the differentiation. If we continue with the doxycycline, then we obtain full reprogramming. We start to see the uh, pluripotent stem cells in the adult mouse. We are generating these early embryonic cells in the adult. At this point, we have to stop giving doxycycline because otherwise the mice die. They die because the intestine is very dysplastic, is not absorbing nutrients, the mice get uh, very sick. So at this point, we have to stop. If we stop giving doxycycline, another thing that is remarkable happens, and is that uh, many of the, these day differentiation goes back to normal. Some cells, some of the reprogrammed cells, are able to produce teratomas, and this is the evidence that we achieve fully pluripotent stem, uh, uh, state in vivo. But I will go back to this later. Um, let me show you an example of this day differentiation. This is the large intestine, and here we are labeling the large intestine with cytokeratin-19, and you can see this is a normal crypt However, in this script, something happened. In this script, the cells have lost cytokeratin-19, and they are starting to express, some of them, this protein, NANOG. NANOG is a protein that is unique to the pluripotent stem cell. It's a, it's a protein, it's a gene that was only expressed in the first five days post-fertilization, before implantation. So we are, we are reactivating a very early embryonic gene in vivo in the adult. This is probably a clone of cells that has expanded, and they are at different degrees of the differentiation and reprogramming. Uh, this is another situation in the stomach. You can see also this the differentiation. So now we have a tool to induce. We can induce reprogramming, which is nice. But in addition, if we stop earlier, we have a tool to induce the differentiation in many tissues. We can observe this in the kidney, the pancreas, in the liver. Not in all the tissues, and I will go back to this in a second. For example, in the lung, we didn't observe reprogramming. Um, when we had this observation, we wondered about damage, because remember, the differentiation uh, only happens in an adult when there is an injury. Only if the tissue is injured, there is the differentiation of the cells to repair. So we started to, to wonder if in these Yamanaka factor reprogrammable mice, we were also inducing damage. And there was precedent in the literature that the Yamanaka factors, they contain oncogenes, and they produce a strong stress in the cells, and many of the non-reprogrammed cells, I mentioned in the beginning that one in a thousand cells reprograms in vitro. What happens with the other 999? Well, many of them undergo senescence. So 
we wonder if this was happening also in vivo, and it does. When we stain for one of the most uh, popular markers of senescence, this is called senescence associated beta galactosidase. This is the endogenous lysosomal protein. You, I hope you can see this light blue color here in this stomach gland. We observe that all the glands that contain nano, where there is full reprogramming, they all contain senescent cells in the neighborhood. This is another example here. We are staining nano in pink and P21 as a surrogate marker of senescence in brown. And you can see that they are next to each other. Every time a gland was reprogramming, there are other, other glands here that are not being reprogrammed. Every time that the gland is reprogramming, there is damage senescence and there is reprogramming. Not in the same cell, but next to each other. And I'm trying to, to bring to mind this idea that when there is an injury, there is damage, and there is the differentiation. So we are recreating that instead of with a physical injury or chemical injury, we are doing that with the Yamanaka factors. Some cells, for reasons that we don't understand, undergo damage, and some cells, for reasons we don't understand, they undergo reprogramming. But they are always go together. I mentioned that we don't observe reprogramming in the lung. And when we examine the lung, we observe that the Yamanaka factors, for reasons we don't understand, again, <laughs> there are many things we don't understand, for reasons we don't understand, the Yamanaka factors, although they are expressed, they are not producing damage. The lung is very resistant to the damage induced by the Yamanaka factors. This is staining for this beta-galactosidase and is negative and therefore there is no reprogramming. So no damage, no reprogramming. So what we did here is to produce an ectopic damage. Now, chemically, with bleomycin, we produce damage in the lungs. Now we have a lot of senescence in the lungs, and now we have reprogramming. Again, with this idea that the damage creates the right environment for the reprogramming to happen. So the Yamanaka factors, they cannot reprogram by themselves. They need something from the uh, damaged microenvironment. So we have been looking for that factor that is in the, in the, in the damaged microenvironment. And we went to repeat these experiments in vitro. I'm going to skip this quickly because I prefer to tell you other things. Uh, I'm going to go, and this is published. I'm going to go to the, to the message, and the message is that IL-6, interleukin-6, is a key factor for this uh, the differentiation and reprogramming. Basically, uh, and this has been also demonstrated genetically, if we block uh, IL-6 in vivo, we don't have reprogramming. If we inject recombinant and IL-6, we have more reprogramming. But this would be the summary. Imagine a tissue, and now there is a, a damage, or we activate the Yamanaka factors. When we activate the Yamanaka factors, some cells undergo senescence because they are damaged. These cells that are damaged, they start to produce this secretome. And a key factor in this secretome is IL-6, a very well-known factor involved in many uh, tissue repair processes. So IL-6 is essential for some cells that are in the vicinity to undergo the differentiation, and these cells presumably are the ones that are going to repair the tissue. Um, one aspect that is interesting is that with this reprogrammable mouse, we uh, can now modify this de differentiation mm, mm, pharmacologically. Uh, we, can, uh, we can have conditions with low reprogramming or with high reprogramming by treating the mice with drugs. For example, with palmocyclic, which is approved for breast cancer. This is a drug that stabilizes senescence. 
If we stabilize senescence, we have more reprogramming. There is more senescence, there is more IL-6, there is more reprogramming. We recommend an IL-6, I already mentioned that. Navitoclax, Navitoclax kills senescent cells. I will talk about that later. And if we kill the senescent cells, then there is no IL-6, then there is no reprogramming. And also, these are the drugs for uh, the inflammatory response or anti-IL-6 antibodies. So we are trying to learn with this system. I think it, is a very, uh, it has advantages over other systems. We are trying to learn how cell de-differentiation happens in vivo. How can we manipulate that in the hope that what we learn with the Yamanaka factors can be applied to real injury situations. One of the things that we are trying to do is this rejuvenation. This is something that has been published by the group of Izpisua del Monte. They published that short and intermediate reprogramming, a short period of activation of the Yamanaka factors, is able to rejuvenate uh, the chromatin of the cells in vitro and is able to make the mice more resistant to damage. But we wanted to test if this is true, if this epigenetic remodeling rejuvenation also happens in vivo, because that has not been demonstrated. So for that, so we are trying to, to go from here to make the mice younger, not to go to the uh, IPS. So instead of maintaining doxycycline for two weeks and have full reprogramming, we are stopping here. We are stopping in the, in the intermediate reprogramming. So we produce this reduction, this uh, loss of differentiation, and then we switch off. And when we switch off, we don't get teratomas in the mice. And actually, we get, um, we get full recovery of the normal uh, histology. The, the tissues look absolutely normal. So in this experiment, basically what we are doing is we are giving doxycycline for one week. There is this foci of the differentiation in the pancreas, in the liver, in the kidney, and in so on, in, in different tissues. And then after one week, we remove the doxycycline and everything goes back to normal. And the question is, the cells that have gone through this process of going backwards and then going forward, are they younger or not? Here, um, <clears throat> we uh, started to collaborate with the laboratory of, uh, of Wolf Rake uh, in Cambridge because he is one of the groups that has reported an epigenetic clock in mice. The epigenetic clock is changing the, the field of, um, of aging. Uh, this was one of the pioneers, is Steve Horvath. He published the first, or one of the first uh, epigenetic clocks. The epigenetic clock is actually a DNA methylation clock in humans, and this is the best marker of biological age that exists by far. Uh, similar clo these clocks have been improved and refined, and, and they are very accurate, and they can measure the, the biologically how old we are. The same is true for the mice, and this is uh, the work of uh, Wolf Rake. So basically what we have done with him is uh, to compare the pancreas of the young mice with old mice, and now old mice that have been exposed to one, to one uh, period of transient reprogramming to refresh their cells. That is the idea. We call this reset. OSKM, the Yamanaka factors, are on for one week, and then they are off for two weeks, and here we analyze if these mice are now younger or not. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so what we have done uh, uh, is that we have measured um, methylation at promoters and enhancers, and they have selected, the laboratory of uh, Wolfreg, they have selected those promoters and those enhancers that change the methylation status 
either gain, or methylation, gain of methylation or loss of methylation. Doesn't matter. Actually, the methylation clock contains uh, cytosines that gain and cytosines that lose methylation. It's in both directions. Mm, they have selected those promoters that are, the methylation is changed with aging and the enhancers. And here we have done a principal component analysis, and I hope with this uh, little drawing I can help you to see how, how the young uh, promoters and enhancers are clustered here. Here are the old enhancers in, in the, and promoters. Uh, sorry, promoters and enhancers. And here are the uh, reset. I don't know where should I point this. Um, well, I think that as it usually happens, the, the, the batteries are gone. Uh, okay, now. <laughs> <laughs> well, it doesn't matter. Maybe someone can pass this with the keyboard. Or... Okay, okay, well, this is the idea. The, the... Okay, well, well the, the, young, the young goes to the old, and these are the reset, the, the mice that have been exposed to one week of rejuvenation by the Yamanaka factors. We are analyzing these promoters and so on. And let me move now to, the, uh, to this. So I've been talking about, uh, he, this one is the one that doesn't have the pointer, but doesn't matter. Uh, I've been talking about, the, about this area that is there in the top. Uh, and I am putting there IL-6 as a key factor in this uh, repair. Let me now talk about the, um, in, about the diseases that are associated to senescence. Um, this is a list that is outdated already about all the human diseases, human, I'm not talking about mice now, human diseases where pathologists have found senescent cells. And they have been found essentially everywhere. They have been found in Alzheimer's disease, in Parkinson's disease, in the astroglia and, micro, and in uh, microglia. Uh, in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, COPD, liver fibrosis, in obesity, very, very important, uh, cardiac fibrosis, atherosclerosis, and so on. E every disease that is degenerative disease contains these senescent cells. And these senescent cells, we believe, are the fuel, are the ones that are sustaining the chronic inflammation and the fibrosis. Um, one thing that has not been demonstrated, and this is some published data, is if the senescent cells by themselves are able to produce fibrosis, a, a, a disease. So in this experiment, we have taken lung fibroblasts, human fibroblasts, non-senescent or senescent and we make them senescent in vitro. Uh, maybe if someone can get the, can you get it with the battery, the one that has the pointer? Okay. Uh, uh, okay, so the non-senescent and senescent, and we, we are injecting this fibroblast into immunocompetent immunocompromised mice. When we inject the non-senescent cells into an immunocompromised mouse, nothing happens. These non-senescent non cells, they disappear. Actually, it is here. These are the, these are the, uh, well, this is the. No, you have both. Ah, okay, okay, thank you. I take this away. So <laughs> thank you. Know. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> uh, Okay, uh, well, what I was saying, uh, we inject here non-senescent fibroblasts into new mice, nothing happens, nothing happens. However, if we induce in vitro, in vitro, we induce these cells to become senescent and we inject them, 
we obtain here a nice fibrosis. This is the H&E and the Mason, and here we can detect the human cells with human, anti-human vimentin, and we can actually see how the human cells are producing a human fibrosis, are, are producing the fibrosis, and also murine fibrosis, because it's known that the senescent cells with this uh, storm of cytokines that they produce in the, in the microenvironment, they generate senescent cells. So this is how the, we believe, this is how the disease progresses. It starts with a focus of uh, senescent cells producing fibrosis, but this focus of senescent cells propagates, not because the cells divide, but because the cells are inducing senescence in the neighbor cells, and then these cells in the neighbor cells, and so on. Hmm. Okay. Um, so, one of the um, revolutions, if I may use that word, in our field has been to find therapies that eliminate these senescent cells. Uh, chemicals, drugs that preferentially kill senescent cells and not normal cells. And this is what is called senotherapies or senolytic drugs. And these drugs, they reduce the number of senescent cells in a particular disease and they produce therapeutic improvement. Um, this is again the, the same thing. Uh, <coughs> Uh, here it is, uh, well, uh, disease tissue has abandoned uh, senescent cells. And basically, the idea is to reduce the number of these senescent cells. Remember, senescent cells are not old cells, are damaged cells. Uh, I am very really meeting this. So in mice, it has been demonstrated that these drugs are able to produce therapeutic improvement in all these diseases, and this is remarkable. One, these are the two gold standards of senolytic drugs for the moment. One is Navitoclax, it's a non-approved uh, drug that went through all the cl clinical trials for a chronic lymphocytic leukemia. But it wasn't approved at the end because of a side effect of thrombocytopenia. But uh, this drug works fantastically well by killing these senescent cells. Senescent cells are, they are primed to undergo apoptosis. They are not apoptotic, but they are primed to undergo apoptosis. So if the, if the activity of the BCL2 family is reduced a little bit, the cells undergo apoptosis, whereas normal cells do not undergo apoptosis. And the other drug is the satinib. This is an approved drug for chronic lymphocytic leukemia, if I remember correctly, and this, or chronic myeloid leukemia. And this drug uh, is not clear how it works, but it works. Nobody knows the target. This is a promiscuous tyrosine kinase inhibitor. What is remarkable is that these two drugs, independently, they have therapeutic activity on so many diseases that are so different. Some of them are very different, like atherosclerosis, or Alzheimer's, or pulmonary fibrosis. And this is part of the excitement. This has been shown in mice. Now there are six clinical trials ongoing in the Mayo Clinic for pulmonary fibrosis, for kidney fibrosis, and for other diseases. There is one interim report about the clinical trial in, in pulmonary fibrosis, and it's promising. It's still too early, but it's promising. So in the next few years, we will know how this new class of drugs is working for these uh, diseases. One problem uh, with all this in, in this field is that there are no laboratory medicine uh, techniques to detect senescence in real patients in a clinical environment. We can detect senescence in the mice because we sacrifice the mice and we examine the tissues, but there is no serum marker or uh, imaging, mark, uh, imaging technique to detect senescence in real patients. And this is a, a big bottleneck because it's difficult to follow the, the efficacy of these uh, clinical trials if the target is being reached or not. I'm going to show you one example with one senolytic drug that we have developed, and I'm not going to explain it, how it works. It's not important. It is already published. 
is to give you an idea of uh, the kind of experiments that have been done in mice. Um, here we are giving bleomycin to the mice, uh, bleomycin, and then 10 days later we do pletismography to measure how well or bad the mice are uh, expanding and contracting the lungs. All the mice treated with bleomycin, gray, green, and red, are very damaged. They have a lot of resistance to air, whereas these are the controls. After this point, we also do computer tomography, and then every day we give to, the, to these mice this senolytic drug. We give this senolytic drug to the ones that are in red, and you can see how they recover at the end of the treatment. They recover normal elasticity. They are not completely cured from the fibrosis. I'm not going to show all the data. Uh, but they have recovered elasticity, which is very important for the patients. Whereas the other controls that are here, they remain, of course, uh, very bad. This is an example, an illustration of one uh, image of computerized tomography. <clears throat> So this is one particular representative mouse. We did this with uh, eight mice or nine. Uh, this is one mouse, and because you don't have to sacrifice them here, you can follow them longitudinally. So this is one particular mouse, and this particular mouse had the damage here in this area and in this area. The, the, the damage produced by bleomycin produces a unique fingerprint in each mouse because the, the bleomycin is distributed randomly to the bronchioles. And the same mouse, the very same mouse, 18 days later, you can see how the fibrosis has been reduced and here almost uh, completely reduced. And the, well, this is the, the idea of the senolytic drugs. And I want to finish with another story that is unpublished and maybe um, I hope you find it interesting, that has to, do <clears throat> has to do with the origin of the damage, the physiological origin of the damage in, in humans. Um, when, we, uh, when we induce in mice experimentally senescence, we treat them with drugs like bleomycin or doxorubicin or irradiation things like that, and that is very efficient, and we know how we have produced the damage. But what about a, a, a person, a person that has developed uh, one of these fibrotic diseases? Which has been the insult, the damage that has originated all this process? Um, we started to make observations when we were analyzing the histology of the fibrotic lungs in mice, we started to observe that there were a lot of uh, red blood cells in the lesions, red blood cells outside the vessels. Um, this is 14 days after bleomycin in the lung. So in a normal lung, the red blood cells are in the in vessels, as they should be. This is the fibrotic lesion. And in the fibrotic lesion, I hope you can see all these red blood cells that are in the lesion, and they are not in, in the vessels. And at this time, the initial damage has been, is gone. I mean, the bleomycin has disappeared, and there is no more damage. Bleomycin is one, uh, one shot of bleomycin, and that's it. So we started to suspect, to find this very uh, strange. Why is there a lot of... Uh, in, in, red blood cells outside uh, extravasated. We stay in for iron, and we focus on iron because red blood cells contain a very dangerous uh, component, and is iron. Iron is important for all our cells, and is bound to critical proteins. However, free iron is very damaging. And the only cells that have high levels of iron are uh, red blood cells. So we stay for uh, iron, and we found also that in the lung, in this uh, 
fibrotic lesions, there were many macrophages full of iron. So indicative that because there are many red blood cells outside the vessels, there is a lot of hemolysis, and there are red blood and there are macrophages uptaking the iron. Here in the kidney, we use another model that is folic acid, and 40 days after the initial insult, we can find iron in the kidneys. I don't know if I brought the slides, but the same. Let me see the next one. But we have found the same thing in human pulmonary fibrosis and in human chronic kidney disease. <clears throat> um, if there is hemolysis, is thanks to the work that you do, it's possible to detect hemolysis in the blood, and we detect it. Uh, we can find uh, free hemoglobin in the serum. 14 days later, there is still free hemoglobin. This is the model of the lung fibrosis. This is the model of the kidney fibrosis. We can also detect the proteins, or the, here is the mRNA in the liver of the proteins that scavenge the um, hemoglobin. This is haptoglobin, and that scavenge heme. This is hemopexin. So these are all evidences that there is an ongoing uh, massive hemolysis due to damage produced locally in the lung. So this is uh, mRNA in the liver produced by a damage that was produced in the lung. <coughs> well, iron itself can induce senescence in vitro very efficiently. I'm going to skip this. And it can also produce um, fibrosis very efficiently in vivo. Here we are injecting bleomycin. This is a typical model. And here, in, as a comparison, this is iron. And these are lysed red blood cells, indicating that iron itself is able to produce massive fibrosis. One thing that we are trying to do now is to test if iron chelators can delay or protect from fibrosis. We are using one of the two orally available uh, iron chelators. They were developed for a macro, a macroma, uh, I never know how to pronounce this uh, disease, a macromacytosis, more or less. And here, what we are doing is we are giving this uh, chelator, the ferry prone, to the mice. Here we are treating the mice with folic acid. As I said, this is a model of proximal uh, tubular damage. And the consequence of that is fibrosis, atrophy of the kidney, and uh, they, they cannot concentrate the urine. They have a very diluted urine, and they have to drink a lot. Uh, this is the size of the kidneys of the control mice, the size of the kidney of the mice uh, treated with folic acid, atrophic. You can see it here, uh, they are atrophic. And these are the mice that are treated at the same time with an iron chelator, and they are protected. This is the urine density, this is uh, concentrated, this is diluted, and this goes back to normal. And you can see here, this is the fibrosis in one example of one mouse and this is another mouse treated with the iron chelator. So this is the direction that we are taking, trying to repurpose iron chelators for uh, protecting the, or for delaying the progression of these uh, fibrotic diseases. And well, this is the idea that I told you about. We think that microvasculature injuries that happen accidentally uh, for many reasons, but of course, if we smoke or if we abuse toxics and things like that, even more. This uh, vascular injury produces the release of red blood cells. They are lysed. They release iron. And this iron is going to produce these senescence. And once this uh, starts, the, this senescence is going to spread and, and is going to cause uh, the, the big problem of the irreversibility of these fibrotic diseases. 
And with this, I'm going uh, to finish with this uh, slide. This is what I was talking about. And I'm going to show you a picture of the members of my laboratory. And uh, I was told there is no uh, questions and answers uh, sections, but I will be around here for the cocktail, and I will be happy to answer questions personally. Thank you very much.